Welcome, folks. Great to see you. Welcome to those online. Andy Hansen with the uh, Institute on Ecosystems. Really enjoying this uh, series of talks by the Yellowstone Graduate Fellows funded through the IOE. So this talk in, today in particular will great interest in uh, representing the intersection of uh, what, biochemistry and microbiology and human health created by aquatic ecosystems. So it sounds like a great topic for being interdisciplinary and, and of course, highly relevant to all of us. Leah Rodriguez is is PhD student program and uh, Dr. Uh, Deborah Kiel, Kyle. Kyle is her advisor. And as we've been doing this semester, um, Dr. Kyle will give an overview of activities within her lab, because that'll be of interest to us, but also to set the context for uh, Maria's talk about her research. Thank you, Andy. All right, um, I'm hoping you can all hear me. That's projecting well. Okay. Thank you for attending, and thank you for. Institute on Ecosystems for supporting our project. So we really appreciate that. So I'm Deborah Kyle. I wanted to give you a little overview of some of the things that we're doing in our laboratory or have been doing over the last few years and more intensely lately with, with Maria. But I want to acknowledge um, that we are especially appreciative to the Bozeman Water Treatment Plant, who has um, very graciously let us um, sample um, influent and effluent from, from the treatment plant. Um, you'll learn a little bit more about some of those measurements and the drugs that we have been um, finding in um, both the influent and effluent with this talk. But I also want to acknowledge some of this work was started in 2017, pre-COVID, um, since that's our marker. And um, and I'm especially grateful to Bob Peterson, Tracy Sterling, and um, Yvanka, who are helpful in finding ways to support some my students, my doctoral student, Miranda. Um, we have Jordan also represented here. He was a doctoral, uh, sorry, master's student with Ellen Lochner and Otto Stein. And now um, we have a new team tackling a new question, a new problem that we've um, uh, Maria will present on, and that includes a collaboration with um, Zoe and Christine Verhill, who couldn't make it today, Frank, and then Sandra is also on the committee. Um, thank you all. So there's a lot of people involved in this particular study. So to your point, Andy, we're going to get there. No, to your point on interdisciplinary, we definitely check that box. So we're measuring drugs that are in the influent at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, so this is a measure of public health consumption or public health dumping of drugs into the water. So a couple of things that we can um, interrogate here. So we started doing some of this work with Miranda, my first doctoral students. Um, dissertation is identifying what the community was using. And we can learn what the drugs of abuse are. We can learn what's dumped down toilets. It's a little bit trickier to identify, you know, and isolate the parent compound versus parent plus metabolite, but there are opportunities to do that. We, um, we know that the wastewater treatment plants set up to treat that water. What's important to know, it's not their job to take out drugs. That is, this is a new observation and with it, new um, potential problems. Um, but we don't have enough data right now really to drive you know, changes here in this wastewater treatment plant, and maybe some of our studies collectively will help 
um, discern um, how much is too much. So now we have the effluent post treatment, and this is what um, most of Maria's work will um, hit on is in this space, we are learning about what goes into the nearby river. In our local community, we're focused on the East Gallatin River and, um, and what's going into that river stream. And we want to know what drugs are escaping and what drugs are affecting the aquatic species. And Maria will fill you in on some of that. So I wanted to acknowledge um, our key partner. We don't get to, I don't get to see them all the time, but I do want to acknowledge um, uh, their graciousness to let us come in and, and sample sometimes on a very short notice. So thank you very much for your help. Um, and I just also want to bring to your attention we do not have regulations for, you know, some of what's released from wastewater treatment plants. Um, and as we learn more, my hopes in the long term is that some of our data will help drive better safety um, regulations or safety measures benchmarks that will um, um, preclude or stop um, some of the um, drugs going into our surface waters. So, um, so to the point, Andy, on interdisciplinary, and many of you probably are familiar with the One Health um, initiative through the CDC, and and how more and more of our studies are tied from between public health, clinical health, and what's happening in our environment. And I think um, after you hear a little bit of our data. Um, that you'll see that there's um, a lot of interconnection that's happening here. And this is um, uh, in terms of what One Health stands for, where we examine human health, animal health, feedlots, things like that, that are also potential runoffs into rivers, and environmental health, you know, what's happening in our rivers and downstream. Um, you'll see that. Uh, some of our early work in 2017 with Miranda and Jordan hit on the question about public health. You know, how much is the community using in terms of prescription and illicit drugs? And now Maria and team are working on downstream. Okay, so just to give you a sense of all the different drugs that we can test for, there's a lot. And Maria will go into a lot more detail on them. Um, we haven't gotten to marijuana yet. We expect it to be very high. Um, if anybody's uh, familiar with LC mass spec, um, we, we expect really high samples of the flood uh, column and whatever. But anyway, uh, but we will be doing uh, marijuana soon. Um, so, and I just want to focus in on a couple of questions. I might go through this a little quickly, realizing that uh, Maria has a lot to share with you. So, um, Water epidemi wastewater epidemiology. What's cool about this discipline is it's data driven and it's almost in real time. We can get a sample from the um, wastewater treatment plant, the influent, that is representative of the drug use in the past 24 hours. And so how do we use these data? And um, we can address questions like what's the profile of illicit drug use? Does community prefer cocaine over methamphetamine? <laughs> um, cocaine seems to be the drug of choice for for Bozeman. Um, does drug use change with a recreational event? Not that sweet pea festival would bring in drugs, but maybe it does. We don't know. And um, can we see, see some changes with that? And does drug use change with an intervention? And so we can use this as an outcomes assessment for public health interventions and initiatives, different initiatives. Um, and also, if we were to see elevated um, opioids, um, including fentanyl, do we need to get more Narcan also known as naloxone available to the community. So I can I just wanted to give you an example of different ideas, questions that we can use to to help um, use these data in a, a meaningful way. 
So a little bit on Miranda's work and Jordan's work. So we were, we were able to calculate doses for 1,000 residents. This is Bozeman. This is for April 2019. Here's doses. Here is this week in April. And I'm just giving you a small snippet of some of the data that we've collected. And here you can see blue are cocaine. So we have um, approximated 50 doses, 50 doses, whether it's one user doing 50 doses, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's 50 people. You know, there's some um, there's some um, limitations. But we can see, you know, how this um, is uh, one of our biggest used, largest used greatest use <laughs> drugs that um, in this community. We have amphetamines down here. Um, and we also have um, in this gray one methamphetamine. Um, so we can see cocaine is used more than methamphetamine. Um, we've worked with some other communities where it might have been the, where it was the opposite. And here in the blue, we have noroxycodone, uh, metabolite of oxycodone. And here in the yellow MDMA, which is a metabolite of MDA, which is ecstasy. So we've been able to identify some of those trends. So I um, apologize. I think my um, animations here got a little disrupted. But what we see here are some interesting patterns that are relevant to MSU. Um, Ritalin use is um, high during exam time here on campus. So, and that was identified in that um, uh, period of time. And after exam week, cocaine and MDA increase. So we don't need the Ritalin anymore. We're gonna have fun. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so you can see some behaviors that might um, be changing based on some of the events in our community. We don't see anything like bath salts. So that might be something that um, is not abused as much. And, but we consistently see gabapentin um, which is a nerve, um, an agent to um, stop nerve pain, and also um, is helpful in epilepsy. Okay, so one of the other things that we learned with Jordan and Miranda, um, who were the investigators, the graduate student investigators, was that what gets removed by a waste treatment plant, just as it is without any particular focus on these drugs of abuse. And we find that um, these are some of the averages that we found in terms of its removal. When it comes to morphine, 60% removed. So still a sizable fractions moving through that wastewater treatment plant. Um, and you can see the list here. I'm going to move through this quickly. And tramadol comes up in our study. Oh yeah. And we see that it's not removed, at least in some of our earlier data. So that's passing through that wastewater treatment plant and getting out into the East Gallatin. Gabapentin, half of it's removed. And I just want to say gabapentin is something that has been used um, a lot in our community. We see that pattern going into the river. And we also see ketamine, not removed, Ambien not removed, and norfloxetine and its metabolite, Prozac, and um, a portion of it is removed. So these are helpful pieces of information to understand, you know, again, what do we need to be concerned about in our ecosystem? So with that, I will hand it over to Maria, um, who has been exceptionally good at <laughs> um, doing this uh, study and who has agreed to not only work in clinical medical areas in toxicology, but now expand into ecology. Um, so it's been, um, and she's uh, risen to that occasion very, very well. So thank you, Maria, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Great. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Cal. Can you guys hear me okay? I usually don't need a microphone, never get complaints of me being too quiet. Um, okay, so I'll talk um, more about what we've been working on in ecotoxicology. 
So moving from that public health perspective with Jordan and Miranda, and stepping into this idea of, okay, now that we know that the drugs are getting into our systems, into our natural environment, uh, how can, what, how, what are the impacts of those? Um, awesome. So back in 2008, the EPA uh, published a paper that they, a white paper that they labeled aquatic life criteria for contaminants of emerging concern, where they describe what emerging concern means. So contaminants of emerging concerns are defined as chemical or substances that have been detected in our natural environments, like uh, surface waters or soil. That doesn't necessarily mean that they weren't there before. It means that now we're probably able to detect it because we have better technology. And there's also have been an increase in the consumption of those. In that paper, they listed a couple of the contaminants of emerging concern. For example, things that we, you probably heard of before, like perfluorinated chemicals, flame retardants, personal care products, and our main concentration today, human pharmaceuticals and veterinary pharmaceuticals. It's a broad term that covers many things. It could be any chemical or substance that creates a biological change within the body. It could be good changes that extends life or helps with curing diseases. Things like taking vitamins. Sometimes we, I feel that sometimes we forget that vitamins are also considered pharmaceuticals. So if it's over the counter, chances are you are being used in pharmaceuticals for a while. Like vitamins, um, vaccines, citalopram, insulin injections, nicotine, antibiotics. And some of them are not so good, like drugs of abuse. We have things like creatine or metrogenin, cocaine, fentanyl, and crystal meth. All of those are other red out pharmaceuticals, and they're also classified as contaminants of emerging concern. The thing is, we have changed in 2008. We still have that same list of emerging concern, and we still have no regulation for them. And that's because we don't have enough research that will guide us of what the safe thresholds are, or what are the consequences of this from specifically pharmaceuticals in the environment. Before we can talk about what we're doing on the ecotoxicology side, I need to give you a toxicology 101 metabolism pathways situation here. So when uh, people are consuming drugs, uh, the main uh, priority of the body is take all the benefit and none of the side effects and get rid of what you don't need. And for that, we have two different phases within the body. So phase one and phase two, one is enzymatic and the other one is the, uh, detoxification pathway. Basically, just fancy way of saying your body's making the drug more soluble so you can pee it out. 450 enzymes are a major player in here. They are hemoproteins that account for about 75% of the drug metabolism. They also, uh, some drugs might enhance or suppress the activity of, en of this kind of enzymes. And humans have about 18 different families and 44 subfamilies of these enzymes. And you might be asking, okay, that's cool. We talk about public health. How does this matter for ecology? Well, it turns out fishes also, fish also have uh, cytochrome P450s, and they are also known to express this to get rid of toxic um, pharmaceuticals or any toxins within the environment. So what I need you to, now that you have your toxicology 101, the one thing that I need you to remember is fish can also metabolize drugs, but we don't know to which extent or how they work out. We don't have enough knowledge like we have with humans. Okay, so how long were drugs getting to the environment? You know, when if somebody would have told me that for part of my dissertation was going to have a toilet on my presentation, <laughs> yes. So anyway, how do we get in the environment? So they get excreted out from this creation. They go into the sewage water. Uh, water treatment plant receives them, and then they get into our surface water. So let's talk about a simple example, oxycodone, a commonly prescribed opioid for pain. If you go to the dentist and you got your wisdom tooth removed, you probably got prescribed oxycodone at least once in your lifetime. Oxycodone will be our parent drug. So that's the drug that you're consuming. Within the body, it gets metabolized by two uh, different enzymes that are part of the family of the P450s. And they get metabolized into um, metabolites, oxymorphin and noroxycodone. All of those get excreted into the environment. Why do we care about metabolites? The fact that we can see metabolites in the environment means that this is not just oxycodone getting dropped off. There is some sort of metabolism happening that are converting it into the more soluble molecules. However, things are not always that simple. 
opioid, um, sorry, um, drugs are always different. And things like gabapentin, for example, they don't go through the metabolism. They actually get excreted immediately through your renal system. So the gabapentin goes unconverted right into the water through the implants. So right to the fluorosis. I just mentioned that okay, human consumption leads to feces and urines. They go into the water treatment plant, and then from there to the surface water, they become into sediment, and then fish and invertebrates can get exposed to it. And I wish that was a full story. However, we also need to account for consumption in hospitals and care healthcare houses. We need to account for human waste. Sometimes, if you are not taking your pills, you decide to dump them down the drain and they get into the landfill and groundwater, or if you just cause them into regular trash and they're not properly disposed. Then we have a veterinary use, and this becomes even more complicated. About 75% of our antibiotic consumption comes from agricultural uses. So they get into manure, into soil, and then run off and end up into our surface water. And then last but not least, we have our pharmaceutical factories and aquaculture that also all of those ends up somehow in our surface water. So for my dissertation, this is my only one person. I cannot cover all of this, and our team is trying. Um, so we are concentrating mostly on this section of what's happening from feces and urine to the wastewater treatment plant, surface water, and then how is that affecting the um, rivering ecosystem. And for that, we started with the survey of the East Gallantry River. Um, our principal investigator led by Dr. Zoe Pratt and in collaboration with Dr. Stewart, Dr. Kyle, and Dr. Burhill, uh, we have this grant submitted with the obje first objective to determine what is the concentration of the drug of the grading of drug contaminants in the East Gallantry River. So we just wanted to see are we seeing drugs in the surface water? And then after that, our objective number two was to evaluate if those drugs are bioaccumulating in a native species of Rocky Mountain sculpin and invertebrates. And for that, we um, sample water at six, six sites downstream of the Bozeman Water Treatment Plant. So um, if you can see the map, it's not super detailed because some of these ones are private property. So for our protection, we're just going to show you the overall. But we started at site one. So site one is our control site. It's a location that is right upstream the effluent. Okay, so if you remember from Dr. Powell's talk, the effluent is what's coming out of the water treatment plant. So our site one is about 10 meters upstream of that. Then we have our site two, which is our effluent water. Uh, and it was tested directly from the wastewater treatment plant. So it will be right over here. And then we have about six, six different sites that's downstream, sites downstream, which are about 10 meters downstream as much as possible, as much as we could with the private sites. Um, for about one kilometer down. As Dr. Kyle mentioned, we tested multiple pharmaceuticals. We actually have the capacity to test about 63 different pharmaceuticals. Among those, we have 15 pain management opioids, example of those codeine, fentanyl, oxycodone, uh, 13 antidepressants such as citalopram, fluoxetine, amitriptyline. You'll notice that gabapentin is under the antidepressants. So gabapentin, as Dr. Kyle mentioned, is prescribed for the FDA's approval, approval is for seizure medication, but it's being used off label as antidepressants and anxiety medication as well. So it's been slowly moving towards uh, part of the antidepressant panel. 13 illicits, including meth, PCP, methylene, cocaine, 10 benzodiazepines, so things like Tanex, clonazepam, diazepam, and seven substance use disorder treatment drugs, um, so drugs that can revert. Um, opioid abuse, for example, like methadone, naloxone, and three non benzogabergic just now sulfidin, for example, ambient effect. Um, if you guys saw the ambient effect on Netflix, a very good documentary about the effects of sulfidin, and then two stimulants, amphetamine, and regalinic acid. Okay, so we have 53 drugs that we tested. To test for objected one, we followed the same procedure Jordan and Miranda were using for their extractions. And we use an LCMS work. So I won't go through the whole detail, but just know that we collected the waters. We concentrate the waters using a solid phase extraction method, and then they go into our um, L validated LCMS for detection of 663 drugs. So we were fortunate enough to continue with this research for about a year. So we started in 2022, and then we were able to continue with it this year so we can compare 
what are the trends if the trends are different between both years. So we started in 2022. Right now I'm showing you what we found coming out of the water treatment plant. So the effluent, the 24 hour composite sample coming out of the effluent into the surface water. I know this is a pretty big graph, so I'm just gonna um, basically um, show you what we found and spell it out over here. But just know each color over here is a different date. And then you have the drugs over here and all of our concentrations are in parts per billion. Out of the 63 drugs that we tested, we found 20 pharmaceuticals coming out of the water treatment plant. 10 of them were pain management opiates, like codeine, oxymorphone. Remember that Dr. Pell said that tramadol doesn't get removed. It was actually our highest opioid coming out of the effluent. We also found methadone and its metabolite EDDP and ritalinic acid right over here. And then three illicits, uh, methamphetamine, benzodiazepine, which is a metabolite of cocaine, and MDMA. Three antidepressants, amitriptyline, citalopram, and the metabolite of citalopram, as well as fluoxetine, and then gabapentin. Gabapentin has to have their own graph because the concentrations were so high that the other ones looked minimal in comparison. So that's 2022. So moving ahead to 2023, we tested uh, different sites in June which is about the same time that we tested last year. So last year, all the results that I show you were from May, June, and part of July. Right now, here are all samples from June of this year. This time around, we detected 23 pharmaceuticals. So we have three new players coming into the game, and those are fentanyl, norfentanyl, and tolpidem. And we found in a detectable levels this time around. However, everything else follow a similar trend to uh, 2022. We found the same drugs, except for these new three ones that we've been detecting, including our um, highest player over here, Galapentin. So now that we know that, yes, there are drugs coming out of the water treatment plan due to human consumption or many other routes, how are the pharmaceuticals, is the pharmaceutical, are the pharmaceuticals detected in the effluent? Are, are they detectable downstream? So that's a part of the information that we didn't get from Miranda and Jordan. We knew that we were gonna find stuff out of the water treatment plant. We just didn't know if we were gonna find things in the river. So back in 2022, we tested multiple days. Here I'm just showing you one of the most representative one. So this is 2022. This is the concentration of drugs that we found in June 24 of last year, okay? These are the pharmaceutical concentration downstream. So you will notice that site two is the data that I already showed you. And now we're gonna be looking at everything that's coming up downstream from site three all the way to site seven in this case for this graph over here, okay? We were expecting a gradient effect. We thought, at least I was in the expectation that we were gonna find highest concentration closest to the water treatment plant and then lower as we go farther away. But as you can see, that couldn't be farther from the truth. We detected seven pharmaceuticals downstream sites. Uh, we detected citalopram and desmethylcytalopram, so that antidepressant comes back again. Ritalinic acid, benzodiazepine, the cocaine metabolite, and tramadol, and all methyltramadol. And the lack of concentration gradient indicates that there might be multiple sources of contamination. So we're not only seeing what is coming out of the water treatment plant. We might be seeing the stuff from septic tanks, people recreate, using recreation in the river. There are multiple sources of the uh, drug con uh, concentration. And then again, gabapentin gets its own graph just because it's so high. This one is interesting though. You'll see over here, there's two different dates for gabapentin concentration. You have June, in, uh, June 24th in blue and September 29th in green. And you'll notice that there was definitely an increase in gabapentin concentrations at the river doses uh, compared to those two dates. So for example, June 24 is pretty low, and then in September we saw a pretty high concentration, actually going higher as we got farther away from the plant, which was interesting trying to find. So moving to the future for 2023, I'm showing you data for almost a year. So we were just one day off. So this is the data for June 23 of this year. And as you can see, the trends are widely different. It's not that we can say, oh yeah, we found similar trends, but we did find the same drug. We still found six pharmaceuticals that were detected at downstream sites. The only difference is this time around, at least for June 23rd, we didn't find any cocaine in downstream sites. But gabapentin is still there. 
And this one was interesting. This time I'm showing you three dates of gabapentin, um, each day represented by a color. On June 19, there was a spike of gabapentin in one of our sites. That was, again, just showing again that there might be something happening between site six and seven where gabapentin got introduced into the system. And again, we're not showing a concentration gradient. We are showing that the, the drugs are detectable, but we're just basically showing that there's way many other questions to ask when we're looking at this. The key points about the pharmaceuticals detected, in case you want to know more about those. So tramadol is a synthetic opioid, and it's commonly used for moderate to severe pain. And its metabolite, that's methyl tramadol, gets constantly uh, detected in the water. So those two usually come together, which is a pretty good indication that we're seeing some metabolism of that drug and that it's getting treated somehow or something is getting is metabolized in it. Then we have our, our, our three players, citalopram and its metabolite, uh, desmethyl citalopram. It's a selective serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitor, just a fancy name for saying it prevents serotonin from being reabsorbed. So it gives you, like, it helps with depression because your serotonin levels stay higher, um, higher concentrations of longer periods of time. And then common use to treat depression and anxiety. Ritalinic acid, Dr. Powell mentioned it, it gets um, um, higher during testing time, but it's, um, it helps with ADHD and narcolepsy. It is a main metabolite of Ritalin. Then benzodiazepine that we see every now and then is a main metabolite of cocaine. And then gabapentin, as I mentioned, was used to be treated usually just for seizures, and now we have them used for pain and anxiety as well. And that one is treated pretty directly from um, kidneys. Okay, now that we knew, okay, we have drug concentrations in the water. Now what? Does that, what does that mean for our fish environment or for the fauna of the river? So moving up to objective number two is, okay, is the drugs bioaccumulating in the Rocky Mountain sculpin? Part of the reason why we selected this specific uh, fish is because it's pretty sedentary. It doesn't really move across the river as much. So it's a pretty good indicator of anthropogenic contaminants at the specific sites. It's also a bottom feeder. So it um, commonly feeds on invertebrates. So it gives us a pretty good um, solution to like, okay, we can not only test the sculpting, but we can test the invertebrates that he's feeding on. So we can see if there is a problem in the ch uh, food chain or if there's bioaccumulation in the food chain. And then we tested the muscle. Uh, we separated the muscle from the skin every time we got it tested because we wanted to make sure that the concentration that we were finding were exactly in the muscle and not any carryover from the water that could have stayed in the skin. Um, although to prevent that, we also made sure everything was pretty dry and make sure there was no leftover water, but just in case we still removed the skin. And then we tested the liver. Again, it's the main site for uh, drug metabolism. So we just wanted to see if we can see any difference in that specific tissue. And then in the fish that were big enough and that we could actually see the gonads, we were fortunate to just test for those as well to see if we see any concentrations of any of the drugs that we detected. And okay, data time. <laughs> um, so in 2022, we collected 10 sculpins per site at all the sites that we selected. So we went from site one, our upstream site, right before the water treatment plant, and then all the other sites downstream from three all the way to nine, okay? Of all the drugs that we tested for, 63 of them, remember we tested 63, we found 20 in the water treatment plant, seven of them were found in the river, and now we are down to one bioaccumulated. So the only one that we detected on the tissue so far is citalopram. So citalopram, Common antidepressant is the only one that has been shown signs of bioaccumulation in muscle and the muscle, skin, liver, and gonads. So in this specific graph over, he graph over here, all our concentrations are in parts per billion. We have our sites over here, and then each color represents a different tissue. Each of these dots is just outliers. Um, I'm learning now as a working in ecology that environmental sampling is really hard, and can everything is standardized, it's even harder. So we do have a couple of outliers, and there is more to discern from this data, and there is more that I need to sit down and with my committee and figure out what else we can ask for this. But what we know so far is we are able to detect, and they are cytalopram is by accumulating in the sculpins tissues. And on top of that, we're not only finding cytalopram, we're also finding its metabolites and this methyl cytalopram coming along. 
So in this graph over here is the same setup. The only difference is these are the concentrations on that and this methyl tricalopran. So you have the parent and the metallic. 20, moving forward to 2023, we didn't test all the sites. We wanted to compare it, but because we didn't see much difference in the last couple of sites in 2022, and lack of we needed more time and money as well. We decided to shorten it up for um, just the sites that were showing high concentrations at the time of testing. So what we did is I tested the water three days before we collected the fish to see where we can find the highest concentration or if there was any trend that could indicate where we should be doing collections. Site six was the one selected. So we kept site one, of course, as our control upstream. We kept site three, which is the closest one to the effluent. And then we just select one of the sites that were downstream, in this case, site six. Electrofishing in July 6 wasn't as easy as in September of last year. So we weren't as lucky to collect 10 fish per site as we would like to. So we were only able to collect nine inside one, five inside three, and six. I'm sorry, four inside six. However, we just did another collection this past um, October 6th. Yeah, October 6th, and I'm still working on that data. So more data to come, and we were actually pretty successful in this last time that we went. So we'll have more data to compare 2023 against 2022. But for now, we still see that Cytalopran still by accumulating and de getting uh, detectable levels in our fish tissues. So a little bit of a comparison between 2022 and 2023. Again, there is way more that I need to analyze in this data, and there is way more trends to find. Um, Dr. Kyle and I were going through Jordans, and now that we know what's getting clear or not, there's a bunch of graphs that will come up out of this. Uh, but for now, what we know for sure is that Calopran and its metabolites are getting detected in the scoping tissues. And we're finding it in liver, muscle, and in gonads as well, in all downstream sites in September and September of 2022 and in June of 2022, well, 2023. Difference between both of them? Well, in 2022, the highest concentrations were found in muscle. In 2023, so far, with the data that I have from June, not the October one, I've been finding highest concentration in skin. Also, in 2022, we didn't detect any cytalopran in the sculpins collected upstream the effluent. This time around in June, we did have, and I'm going to go back to this, this outliers over here, we did have one sculpin that had concentrations of cytalopran upstream the water treatment plant, which is another indication that Again, contamination might become, exposures might be coming from way many different places than just the effluent. And I'm looking forward to see what the October data is going to look like if we're going to see any. Um, because we also wanted to see if the food chain was getting disrupted or is getting uh, bioaccumulation as well. We tested invertebrates. And again, when I told my mom that I was doing insects, she's like, no way you're doing that. Uh, I used to try when I used to see uh, <laughs> anything, but not anymore. <laughs> so now we're doing invertebrates. And the interesting part about this, we were able to collect caddis flies. And in learning more about the sculpins, turns out their preferred invertebrate to eat on is caddis flies. So it was interesting to see that when you look at the data from last year, uh, we tested site one and site three. Site three over here, the closest one to the effluent. We tested different invertebrates between crane fly, larvae, mayfly, stoneflies, and caddis flies. Green over here is caddis flies. It's the only one that is showing high concentrations of cytalopran and its metabolite over here. The other ones, uh, not so, not at all, or the crane fly larvae is a little bit, but not as high in comparison to the caddis flies. Uh, things to keep in mind about this specific data is only from 2022. 2023 is coming. We just did the last collection two weeks ago, so we'll have more invertebrates to test. Also, back last year, this was October 6th of last year, um, we were really successful at collecting invertebrates in site one. Site three became a challenge, and we weren't able to collect as many invertebrates as we would like to, to do an apples to apples comparison and based on numbers. So we're looking forward to add more to this data when we get the October results from this year. But again, this is showing they are, things are bioaccumulating in the fauna of the river. So moving forward, as Dr. Kyle said, now we want to move into a risk assessment. Now that we know the things by accumulating, we need to know what this means for everything. So what is the impact of the environmentally relevant concentrations of cytalopran in the riverine ecosystem? 
And for that, we're working on in vitro exposure to environmental rival concentrations. And we're working with Dr. Christine Berhill and her research um, tech in invertebrate models using Daphnia magna and salmon flies. Um, my section, a little bit that I've been uh, becoming a little bit of more acquainted with is Daphnia magna. Not gonna lie, I thought it was gonna be easier to take care of this ones. <laughs> it's not as easier as I thought it was. It's taking us a while to figure out a way to keep the population growing steadily enough so we can start doing toxicological models. The reason why we selected Daphnia magna is a well used, um, it's a well known model for toxicology. EPA actually recommends it. EPA recommends doing lethal concentration only, though. So, what they want us to do for the EPA specifically, do you expose them to different concentrations until you find the one that kills half of the population, and that will be your LC50. However, we're not finding the high concentration, we're finding sub lethal concentrations in the river. So, we want to see if there is any changes happening below the level of actually killing the model. And for that, there are models like swimming behavior. There are uh, models like movement behavior, heart rate, oxidative stress, and multiple other ones that we can work with the Daphnia, um, uh, in the Daphnia Magna. And yeah, that's what's coming next. And then into the future, we want to survey more sites in Montana, see what is different, if there's any trends different between the, the state, um, if any of the rivers have different uh, drug concentrations. And then also we want to expand the testing menu to include more common antibiotics. Because as we look into the agricultural system and the increased issues with antimicrobial resistance, agricultural runoff getting to the um, surface water, we want to see if there's any effects of antibiotics in that. And with that, I just have to thank a bunch of people that have been helping me through this process. And I wouldn't be able to do it without any of them. And thank you so much for your time. Questions, yes. folks, comments? Treatment plant. Excuse me? You sample upstream from the treatment plant? Yeah, so that's our site one. That's so, one. Okay. Yes, okay. so that's the upstream. The water. That's about 10 meters upstream, the water treatment plant. Yes, I'm just wondering. Yeah. Does it make sense to you that citalopram is a drug you're detecting in the animal? Yes, I mean, is it the one at the highest concentrations? Is it lipophilic? Is it least likely yeah. to be broken down? That's a good one. Yeah. So what we've been finding is really highly lipophilic. So um, the bioavailability of citalopram is about 80%. So it gets taken up easily. Um, that's my hypothesis right now of why that one is. When I compare it against the other six that we've been finding in the river, that one is the one that has the highest bioavailability. So that's the hypothesis I'm working with right now. It's not, it depends on the day. It's not usually the highest one. There are some days where it's highest versus the other ones, but highest one right now is gabapentin. And we haven't seen any gabapentin on the issue, but that one is less bioavailable as compared to cytologram. Yeah, sorry. Those three dots of outliers that you found, um, cytologram and site one, were they all from the same fish? Yes, yeah, they are all from the same fish. Sorry, I didn't specify that, yeah. So all those outliers, which was interesting to see. It was actually, I was excited to see. I just said, okay, something else to think about. Yeah, but they're all from the same fish. Yeah, I'm looking forward to see the October data to see if we see any of that. Um, why do some drugs not get removed as effectively in the wastewater treatment plant or like not at all, if you know? That. That's a good question. I've been researching and it's depending. So the drugs, some of them are more photolytic than other ones, and some of them break out easily in the like, with the you uh, with the sun exposure. Some of them are more soluble than other ones as well. Um, I think that's all the hypothesis that Jordan was working with. Is there anything else, Dr. Kyle, that will? No, I don't think those are pretty rigid. No, we're not sure. There are a lot of I've been finding a lot of research on how to get rid of them and like mechanism, but no one has find one that will get rid of all of them. Uh, I think you have a question before. No, sorry. I thought you saw your hand raised. Yeah. Do you see any relationship between the size of the fish and any of these drug updates? No, I normalized. So the data that I show you is not normalized yet, um, but I did normalize it. I just didn't present it today and I haven't seen any like relation of 
concentration being higher on bigger fish versus the other ones. Yes. Somebody's going to ask about the map of where all the septic permits are along Gallatin oh. River. Yeah. It might be interesting to see the compared density of septic yeah. systems with some of your data. Oh, that would be really interesting to see if that. We tried that. Oh. There was no correlation. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Where else do you think they're coming from? We're, we're still thinking every time I look at those graph, I'm like, where else? Um, yes, let's go. Let's let's go. So, I when I mean, um, trout moves a lot for my understanding is trout moves a lot from sites, like, and then they're not might not be a good indication of that specific site. Um, sculpins specifically, um, they stay pretty much in one section most of their lifetime so it's easier to see what's going on in that specific site with trout it might be a little bit harder to determine if where they pick up the bioaccumulation and this that's my understanding so you have any other oh so this was a very preliminary study and so can't, it's hard to get permission to do studies on like high profile um, species for preliminary studies. So we could absolutely justify trying to do a sample of trout now. But Maria also is absolutely correct that we wanted site specific fish and some limits absolutely are not. And when you shock the water, you get that skull. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A question? Sure. I think I was just wondering the variation of the water samples. How many? Oh, good question. So every time I got into the river, I grabbed two water, at least two bottles uh, every time we collected. So I have an N of two per day per site. Maria, correct me if I'm wrong, but you at a couple sites sampled all over the site. Yes. So, mm -hmm, yeah. So we did collect it on site seven, the one that had that spike of gabapentin that I showed before. We select, we tested seven different sites around site seven. And they were very consistent as well. Well, folks, shall we uh, thank again, uh, Maria?